Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our Thursday afternoon webinar. I'm Melinda Bikini. I'm the Director of Patient Services with the Calangio Carcinoma Foundation. And we are so happy to be joined today by Dr. Lipika Goyle and Dr. Volker Wachek from Taiho Oncology. And Dr. Lipika Goyle is gonna be going over, having an overview of the actionable targets in cholangiocarcinoma, including some of the data from the Phoenix cholangiocarcinoma study. Um, Lipka, I will turn it over to you in just a minute. I just want to remind the audience um, at the end of our presentation, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. Just put your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end of the chat. And I also wanna remind everyone to please try to keep your questions uh, general in nature and not ask specific medical questions to Dr. Goyle as she won't be able to answer those. Um, thank you for joining us and I will turn it over to you, Dr. Goyle. Great, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Melinda. It's really wonderful to be here. And it's really exciting to talk to all of you today about all the progress that we've made in glandiocarcinoma, because even just five years ago, this would have been a much shorter presentation and it would have been a lot more uh, early phase drugs, early phase trials where we talk about, you know, we hope this gets FDA approved, we hope this works, but now we actually have so many FDA approvals, both specifically in cholangiocarcinoma, but also for cancers in general that have certain biomarkers. And so there are a lot more options than there used to be for patients with cholangiocarcinoma. So we're really excited to share some of these exciting results with you. So this is just a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a medical oncologist at Mass General Hospital, and I lead our liver cancer program here. And I've been studying cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma for the last 10 years. And I will say, you know, 10 years ago, when I would come into clinic to help patients, I mainly could only offer them gemcitinine and cisplatin, the chemotherapy combination. And then afterwards, I was really borrowing from what we know from pancreas cancer or other cancers, sometimes colon cancer, to try to use chemotherapies that we've used in those cancers to help my patients with cholangiocarcinoma. But it was a little bit like throwing spaghetti at a wall and hoping something stuck, you know, really just hoping that something that worked in another cancer would work for our patients with cholangio. We just didn't have other things that work. And now you will see that the landscape is broader and, you know, none of us are going to rest there. We're going to keep pushing and try to keep working to get more drugs approved. And so today I'll talk about some of the drugs that are already approved and then some of the promising drugs that are coming down the pipe. So this is what the landscape of carcinoma looked like back in 2010 when I was still in fellowship. And it was like four little birds on a wire. There weren't a lot of pharmaceutical companies, medical oncologists, scientists that were interested in this little orphan cancer. And if you can take a look at the number of trials that were available on clinicaltrials.gov, there are about 110 interventional trials for patients with cholangiocarcinoma. And now when you look in 2022, there are a lot more birds flocking to the wire. There are a lot more pharma companies, a lot of scientists, medical oncologists that are all interested in addressing this disease. And previously, and now you can see there's 473 trials if you look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And previously, patients with cholangiocarcinoma often did not have a home for clinical trials. They were bucketed in with patients with pancreas cancer or a different kind of liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and now there are a lot of trials that are specific for biliary tract cancers or even just for cholangiocarcinoma. And so there's a lot more attention being paid, which we're really excited about, and that's what's contributing to more of these FDA approvals. So a couple of the reasons why there's a lot more interest in the disease is one, instead of throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what sticks, we now are understanding the biology of the disease better. There's been a lot of concentrated efforts by scientists to uh, study models of cholangiocarcinoma and understand the biology. And part of that comes from generous patients, which when they're getting a biopsy, they allow us to take an extra piece of tissue that we send to the lab and then we make cell lines and different kinds of patient-derived models to test drugs in the lab and then design more rational clinical trials and figuring out what works, what combination works, and then putting those into trials. 
Um, and part of it is just using a lot of the models that are banked that we can also study. Overall, we've made a lot of progress in understanding this disease, but we certainly have a lot more progress to be made. Certainly have a lot more progress to be made. So, you know, many people are probably familiar with these terms, intrahepatic glandular carcinoma and extrahepatic glandular carcinoma, but let me just get us all on the same page just to make sure. So uh, this is a picture of the liver right here. It sits right adjacent to the stomach and from the stomach, it goes down into the intestines. And glandular carcinoma is part of the biliary tract. Bile is a substance that's made in the liver. It helps us digest cheeseburgers and ice cream. It helps us digest fat. And basically the liver makes the bile. It floats down these tubes called the bile ducts. It goes into the intestines and then it helps us digest um, anything with fat in it. And so the tubes that are inside the liver, when there's cancer of those tubes, it's called intrahepatic or inside the liver cholangiocarcinoma. When it involves this bifurcation right here, where the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct, that sounds backwards, but it's actually the way it is in the liver, um, the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct, if those are involved with a bifurcation, that's called a Klatskin's tumor or a perihilar tumor, and that's a form of extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And then if it involves the bile duct right here, the common bile duct, that's also called extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And then if a person has a tumor in the gallbladder, that's obviously gallbladder cancer. And then some people have heard of the term periampulary cancer, and that's when the little mouth right here at the bottom of the bile duct, there's a tumor there. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and the treatments that we have for these two diseases. So um, how common is cholangiocarcinoma and how does it compare to other diseases? As you can see, the most common cancers that people get are prostate, breast, lung, and colon cancer. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, as I was mentioning earlier, often did not have a home as a distinct entity. And so when a lot of the cancer statistics are done, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is bucketed in with the other kind of liver cancer I was mentioning, the hepatocellular carcinoma. And so um, similar to hepatocellular carcinoma, it's unfortunately a pretty aggressive malignancy in some patients. Um, and this is why we're really working very hard to come up with new treatments so we can, you know, just take this off the list. We don't want anyone to ever die from cancer, um, but we really want to have more treatment so people can live longer. And so one of the challenges with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is that it poses a diagnostic dilemma. You know, when you have a tumor in the lung and then you biopsy and it shows adenocarcinoma and you can do a couple of stains, you generally know that it's lung cancer. But with liver tumors, it's a little bit more challenging. Majority of masses in the liver when they're cancer are actually metastasis from someplace else. So if someone has a colon cancer or a lung cancer and then it spreads to the liver. Another kind of uh, mass to have in the liver is hepatocellular carcinoma. That's the other liver cancer that I've mentioned a couple of times. It's a primary tumor in the liver. And that's part of the, that's a cancer of the spongy part of the liver. And then cholangiocarcinoma is the bile ducts, as I was mentioning. And so we have, you know, you might have heard your doctor say, oh, I sent it to pathology and we took a look at the stains or the immunohistochemistry. So we do look at certain proteins to see if those are staining on the tumor, but there isn't a specific staining pattern where if a tumor has this protein, then we know it's cholangiocarcinoma. And so we have um, a variety of ways that we look to figure out if it's intrahepatic cholangio, which is, is there a dominant mass in the liver or is there a dominant mass in the bile duct that's causing obstruction? Um, have we done a CT scan or a PET scan of the rest of the body showing there's no other primary anywhere else? And then there's also a new test called the albumin ish assay, which has been around for the last say five to seven years, where that stains positive and there's a higher likelihood that it's cholangiocarcinoma. And sometimes people have what's called carcinoma of unknown primary, where they have a mass, it's biopsied, they can't quite figure out where it is. And so when they've done studies where they compare the expression of certain genes in the tumors that are cancers of unknown primary to a library of biliary tract cancers, bladder cancers, colon cancers, et cetera, they found that biliary tract cancers, such as cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer, 
are the most common cause of cancer of unknown primary. And the Clinger Carcinoma Foundation has done a lot of awareness building among gastroenterologists, pathologists, medical oncologists. So now people whose tumors are being labeled as cancers of unknown primary are increasingly being recognized as intrahepatic laryngeocarcinoma because step one in managing cancer is just knowing what you're treating. So how do we think about treating cholangiocarcinoma? You know, sometimes we talk about cancer in stages, stage one, two, three, four. Another way to think about it is, is the tumor receptible? Is it locally advanced or is it unresectable? And that's generally these are the three buckets that I think of um, cholangiocarcinoma in. So about 20 to 40% of patients are in the category of having resectable tumor. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is closer to 20%. Extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, it's closer to 30 to 40 percent of patients present with resectable disease. Some patients have disease that's locally advanced, which means that the tumor is maybe invading one of the blood vessels locally, or maybe invading bile ducts in a way that it's hard for the surgeon to get the tumor out cleanly just by cutting up front. And then some patients, and this is about 40 percent of patients, and then the remainder of 40 percent of patients um, with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and also often with extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, might present with metastatic disease or a disease that's spread from the primary. And so for patients who have resectable disease, we'll often go straight to surgery, although there's some neoadjuvant trials now where people are trying to do chemotherapy up front and seeing if um, that improves outcomes with surgery. If a person has a locally advanced tumor, we will often try to shrink the tumor and make it easier for the surgeon to cut the tumor out with clean margins. And we'll use chemotherapy, sometimes we'll use radiation. Now there's even trials that we're thinking about using targeted therapies, where if there's a mutation, then we can use a targeted therapy to maybe shrink the tumor. Um, the majority of my talk today will focus in this category right here, where patients come in with unresectable and metastatic disease, or if they had surgery and unfortunately the cancer came back, what are we gonna do next? And so generally speaking, for the past 10 years, there's been the standard of care, gemcitabine and cisplatin. But just a couple of weeks ago, we had an exciting new approval by the FDA, which is the first immunotherapy drug that was approved specifically in patients with biliary tract cancers. And that's this drug called dervalumab. It's a pd one inhibitor. And there was a trial that was done all over the world showing that if you give patients with um, advanced biliary tract cancer, a combination of chemo plus immunotherapy, people live longer than patients who get the chemotherapy alone. So this has become a new standard for anyone that is a candidate for immunotherapy. And then in the second line, we often give different kinds of chemotherapy, but we also always think about clinical trials in the first line and in the second line, because we're always trying to push the envelope and we're trying to give people something better than what's already out there. So you'll hear me say this over and over again, but certainly reach out to your oncologist throughout your care and say, do you have a clinical trial for me? I wanna hear about it. And does it make sense for me to go to a bigger cancer center near me to get a second opinion to see if they have clinical trials? Because at the end of the day, anything that ever gets approved by the FDA is first in a clinical trial. So all the patients that are in the clinical trial get access to those drugs before the FDA actually approves anything. So, um, I'm going to talk about profiling also, because a big part of getting access to drugs is understanding your tumor. So for many years, we used to think of biliary tract cancers by where they were located in the biliary tree. So if it was inside the liver, that was intrahepatic cholangio. If it was outside the liver in this duct, in these ducts, it was extrahepatic cholangio and then gallbladder, as I mentioned. But we have learned a lot about cancer over the last decade. And what we have learned is even within these anatomic categories, you can slice the pizza into multiple different um, pizza slices because there's different kinds of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So as you can see here, um, FGFR alterations are seen in about 10 to 20% of patients. There's FGFR2 fusions, which I'll talk about. There's also mutations and amplifications. Um, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, about 10 to 15 percent or 10 to 20 percent of patients have um, IDH mutations as well. IDH1 uh, has a FDA-approved therapy, which I'm going to talk about. 
We also see BRAF mutations in about 5% of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And I'm going to talk about that for two amplification. And then in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, about 15 to 20% of patients have some kind of alteration that we have drugs for. So for two amplification, 60C mutations, et cetera. And just to take a step back, the Glandial Carcinoma Foundation really has emphasized the value of understanding your tumor. And they have this campaign called the Biomarkers Matter Campaign. And they have a great video on their website to understand what this term biomarker means. So I'm just going to go over it the way I explain it to patients, because I think it's really important to understand this term. So I'm going to use it over and over again. So the way I think about biomarkers in general is that, you know, in our, uh, all of our cells, we have DNA and DNA is the instructions of life. And in cancer cells, there's also DNA, but sometimes there are spelling mistakes in those instructions. And those spelling mistakes are called mutations. And what we wanna do is we wanna send the tumor over to pathology and we wanna understand if we can, uh, ask the tumor, what is going on with you? We find out what are the mutations that we see, what are the spelling mistakes that we see, so that we can give people drugs that can address those spelling mistakes. And you can look for mutations at the DNA level, but then you can also look for uh, different kinds of changes at the RNA level and at the protein level. So the term biomarker is a broad term that encompasses alterations in the cancer at the DNA, RNA, or protein level that help us understand the tumor better and help us choose different kinds of therapies for patients. So we can do something called personalized medicine, which is to match the tumor with the right therapy, because we know that therapies have side effects and we don't want people to get drugs that don't work but have side effects. And the smarter we can be about understanding people's tumors to match them with the right drug up front, the more success we're going to have in terms of killing the cancer, and hopefully the better we're going to help people feel because we're going to give them very specific drugs. Um, if you have any questions as you go along, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. And Melinda, please interrupt me anytime if you see anything that needs clarification. And so when we think about people um, with cholangiocarcinoma who have metastatic disease or unresectable disease, we think about what are the different kinds of systemic therapies that we have to offer people. And systemic therapy is an umbrella term that encompasses three different kinds of therapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. And in this talk, I'm gonna mainly focus on targeted therapy, which are drugs that are specifically focused on mutations that we see in people's tumors. So when you have an uncommon cancer, you have to be very thoughtful about how you study um, the different drugs to get drugs approved by the FDA for these tumors. And so one approach in uncommon cancers is to do a target-specific trial, and that's for alterations that are at a higher frequency. So when you see FGFR2 fusions or IDH1 mutations, they're at a slightly higher frequency, so we have specific trials just for patients with FGFR2 fusion positive cholangiocarcinoma or IDH1 mutant cholangiocarcinoma. Another approach is to have a basket trial, and there are different kinds of basket trials. You can have basket trials where it's a whole, um, it's a whole mix of patients with different tumors, but they all have the same biomarker or the same mutation. An example of that is trials that have been done for these three alterations over here, RET, MTRAC, and MSI. So in these trials, because they're very rare, as you can see in cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, it's 1% or um, 1% to 2%, and it's similar rates in some of the other cancers. They'll do a trial of 50 to 100 patients, and all of them will have a RET fusion, but it's a mix of different tumors. And patients with cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma have, who have one of these alterations can enter into those trials, and drugs can get her approved, and it's called a tissue agnostic or disease agnostic sort of way, which means that it doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have, as long as you have this biomarker, you'd be eligible to get that therapy. Another way to do it is when you have a particular type of mutation that is infrequent in each of the different cancers, but you see it in many different cancers, but it's frequent enough that each of the cancers can get their own cohort. So that's a basket trial that might have five or six cohorts. 
And I'm going to show you that with the BRAF drugs and the HER2 drugs, how these were done in trials where there was a specific cohort for patients with biliary tract cancers. And then there's another way to do it, which is to do an umbrella trial where you have target-specific arms where all patients with cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma can get screened to see if they have an alteration. If they don't have an alteration, they can go on to chemotherapy or some sort of therapy that's not specific for a particular mutation. If they do have a mutation, they can go into one of the arms that's targeted towards the mutation that they have. And so John Bridgewater is running what's called the ABC10 trial in the UK. And this is also an efficient way to be able to move forward with understanding which drugs work in biliary tract cancer. So I'm going to start with talking about FGFR inhibitors and IDH1 inhibitors. And then I'm going to move on to talk about drugs for these indications right here. So I'll spend the beginning talking about this and the next part talking about this. Um, when I get to talking about all of these, I'm going to go over a lot of what we call waterfall plots, which are the data showing how promising these drugs are. So I'm going to start by just going over what is a waterfall plot, because we're going to see so many of them. Um, I'll do it on the next slide, actually. I'll just start with a little bit on FGFR2 fusions. So as I mentioned with FGFR2 fusions, they're mostly seen in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, rarely in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and almost never in gallbladder cancer, but actually helps in making the diagnosis. If you see an FGFR2 fusion, that's most likely intrahepatic cholangioma. And then sometimes patients have an FGFR mutation or amplification, and sometimes these also respond really well to FGFR inhibitors. And when the FGFR axis is normal, you have normal signaling in those cells. When you have one of these spelling mistakes, what happens is it tells the, the cell to grow or to invade blood vessels or sometimes for the tumors to be resistant to chemotherapy. And so the idea is to shut off this signaling so that the tumor stops growing. That's the general concept behind giving drugs to inhibit the FGFR. So this is what's called a waterfall plot. And the very first drug ever approved in cholangiocarcinoma is a drug called pemigatinib, and it's an FGFR inhibitor, and it was approved for patients who have FGFR2 fusion or rearrangement positive cholangiocarcinoma. You're going to see this type of graph over and over again, so let me just explain it real quick. Each bar right here is one patient. So here you can see there's 146 bars, so it's 146 patients. And one of the ways we have, we look at data in a standard way across oncology trials that we can compare one drug to another drug is to have a standard way in which radiologists look at scans. And so we use something called resist criteria where we pick up to five tumors on the scan, a maximum of two tumors per organ, so for example, two lesions from the liver, two lesions from the lung, maybe one lymph node. And the radiologist picks those lesions at the first scan and then follows them on each scan that a patient gets. And then they measure the maximum diameter of each of those, scan, of each of those lesions. They add up that number and that sum is a patient's baseline number. And then as someone is on treatment and hopefully as that tumor is shrinking, and they're measuring the width of each of those tumors, those same five lesions that they're following over time. They compare that to the previous one to get a sense of what percentage shrinkage or growth we're seeing on scans. And so this is basically zero baseline. So if a patient has two scans in a row and there's no um, change, that would be a zero. That would be like you know, no zero percent change. If the patient has 100% change, meaning all of the tumor disappears over time, you get a couple of scans and you really don't see the lesions anymore, that's what this is, 100% um, disappearance of the tumor. And what is this bar right here? This is the 30% mark, because we overall feel that if the tumors, the sum of the diameters of the different lesions, if the tumors shrink by 30% overall, we think of that as having really good drug activity, and we call that the overall response rate. What percentage of patients had an overall 30% reduction in their tumor? And so you're going to see this number over and over again, and this is how we compare different drugs. We say, what percentage of patients on that drug had at least 30% shrinkage? 
And so on the pemigatinib study, 36% of people, that's right here, 36% of the patients had at least 30% shrinkage. And over here, these patients had what's called stable disease. Maybe they had 20% shrinkage, maybe they had 10% shrinkage, maybe they even had 5% growth. That's all called stable disease. So anything between 20% growth or 30% shrinkage, that's called stable disease. So that's this bucket right here. And then if the tumors grow more than 20%, that's called progressive disease. So overall, we think about um, how people are doing by which of these categories people fall into. And then we offer these kinds of numbers to help compare. So we have a sense of how different drugs compare to each other. Now, unless you do a randomized trial and give patients either one drug or another drug, you can't exactly compare across trials because the population of patients that go into different trials is a little bit different, but it at least gives us a little bit of a benchmark of how to think about things. Um, so each of these, again, is a patient going across. You can see among the 146 patients how much water is falling. This is why it's called a waterfall plot. The more you see on this side of the graph, the more effective the drug is in being able to shrink the tumor. So we were really excited to see a response rate of 36% with pemigatinib because when you look at chemotherapy, which is chemotherapy trials are done not in a specific biomarker selected population, but in all comers, and that includes intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, gallbladder cancer, the response rate is around 5%. So we're happy with um, the fact that we're seeing this, but you know what? We would love to see this be 100%, you know? And what we see in lung cancer in patients who have different kinds of mutations like ALK, and ALK fusions or EGFR, we see something that's more like 80%. So there are a lot of companies and uh, scientists and oncologists all working have more water falling here so that we see a lot more patients having tumor shrinkage. So for FGFR and for a lot of other mutations, that's what everybody is working on. This is where we are right now with this being a good drug, but we're always trying to come up with better and better drugs. So this is pemigatinib. This was the first approval. The second approval for cholangiocarcinoma was infragratinib. This is another FGFR inhibitor. And as you can see, you see water falling over here. There was a um, response rate of 23%, so very comparable to pemigatinib. And then there were a lot of patients with stable disease. You know, whenever I see patients, what I say to them on day one when I'm starting therapy is, what does victory look like on your scan? If the tumor is shrinking, great. If the tumor is stable, great. Because at the end of the day, while it always feels good to see tumor shrinking on the scan, it feels good for patients, it feels good for families, it feels good for oncologists. At the end of the day, my goal is to have you have a good quality of life and to live as long as possible. And so if I could offer a drug that makes the tumor shrink like crazy, but only works for three months, or a drug that can keep the tumor stable for 12 months, of course, we all much rather be on the drug that keeps the tumor stable for 12 months because that gives us more time to think about plan B and have more drugs get approved, right? So it's really important that when you see scans and everything is stable, um, as long as the tumor is not causing pain or other symptoms, that's also success. And so with this drug and with pemigatinib, what we call the disease control rate, which is the combination of the people that have at least 30% shrinkage and also the people that are in the stable disease category, that's what the disease control rate is, is over 80%. So over 80% of people get benefit from infragratinib and pemigatinib, and we're very happy about that. But as I mentioned, we're always trying to get better, and we're always trying to come up with new drugs that are going to improve how people do. And so these are data from the company Relay, which makes a drug called RLY4008. And this is a new FGFR inhibitor that's a little bit different than pemigatinib and infragratinib in that it focuses on FGFR2. You know, there are four different FGFR receptors, one through four. And in cholangiocarcinoma, the one that we see most commonly altered is FGFR2. And so we want to be able to come off with a specific type of drug that really focuses and is like a torpedo for FGFR2, and that's what this drug is. 
When you hit FGFR1, as I'll talk about a little bit later, you can get high phosphorus. When you hit FGFR4, you can get some diarrhea. So drugs that are very specific because what we're always trying to do is minimize side effects and increase tumor kill. Um, you can do that with very specific drugs. So they designed this drug to be both very specific for FGFR2 and also very potent, meaning like binding to this receptor like a pit bull, not letting go and then hitting it really, really hard. And so this is a trial that's ongoing right now. And they just presented some data at ESMO, which is the European, a big European oncology conference. And they found that in patients who have FGFR fusion, FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements, who have never had a prior FGFR inhibitor, 63% of patients had significant tumor shrinkage. So you can see that the number of people that are below this line right here is greater than, than the other two um, trials that we just saw. And this waterfall plot is looking at patients who got all different doses, because of course, when we put a drug for the first time in human beings, we have to make sure that we figure out the safe dose. So this is all different doses. But when you look at patients who got only 70 milligrams, which is the dose that they decided was going to be the safe dose to expand at, this overall response rate increased to over 80%. So this is really encouraging, and we're excited about um, this drug and multiple other drugs that are currently in development that are sort of next generation drugs. And Melinda mentioned on the first, when she was introducing me, that I'm going to talk a little bit about fudibatinib. It's another drug. So fudibatinib is similar to Relay in that it's a covalently binding inhibitor. So it binds like a pit bull and is very specific for um, the FGF recept FGFR receptor. And um, this drug also has been showing a lot of promise, and tomorrow, actually, we're going to hear from the FDA to see if this drug um, ended up getting approved by the FDA. This drug had a 42% overall response rate, and that's really encouraging, and we're really hoping that this will be another option that's available for patients. Um, and this is what I talked about with 82% for relay in patients who were on 70 milligrams. And so while we're always very excited about drugs working, we also are very mindful about the impact on people's lives and the side effects they have. And so as I was mentioning that when you hit FGFR1, which is not what we're intending to do, you can get high phosphorus. And so we have different kinds of approaches to make sure that we keep people's phosphorus low. So phosphorus is often in ice cream, yogurt, anything with dairy has a lot of phosphorus. And we can um, both with managing people's diets with them, giving having people drink a lot of water, having to manage any kind of constipation, and also giving medicines to bind phosphorus in food that can all help with hyperphosphatemia. Some of the other things that you see with FGFR inhibitors is it can impact people's nails, it can it cause a little bit of mouth sores in the mouth, it can cause um, some rash on the hands and feet. You know, when we first started getting FGFR inhibitors, we weren't as good as we are now in terms of managing these side effects. Um, but now when, you, when you're proactive, you can actually help a lot with managing these side effects and make the drugs more tolerable. And then in rare cases, people can have an issue with their retina where they can have retinal detachment and they can start to see some halos. It's in less than 10% of patients. And it's usually just what we call grade one or grade two, which is mild. And often when you stop the FGFR inhibitor briefly, um, it goes away. And then often you can just drop the dose if you have to, and it can also be better. But we try to keep people at the full dose, even when they have this, as long as their symptoms are not too severe and as long as they improve. But it's really important for people to see an eye doctor before they see, before they start the FGFR inhibitor, and then regularly while they're on the FGFR inhibitor therapy. So that's finishing up with FGFR. And now I'm gonna talk about the IDH1 inhibitor, Evocidinib. We're really excited. There's another target that has an FDA approved therapy. And, you know, as I mentioned, about 15 to 20 percent of patients with intrahepatic glandular carcinoma and a few patients with extrahepatic glandular carcinoma have IDH1 mutations. And this, you know, very much with input from Melinda. I still remember the day at the Glandular Carcinoma Foundation when we were designing this trial. And, you know, Melinda is very mindful about, and all of us are about, you know, placebo controlled trials and how that impacts patients. And so this trial was very smartly designed where there was a two to one randomization for patients who had IDH1 mutant glandular carcinoma were given um, evocidinib two thirds of the time by the computer and one third of the time they were given placebo. 
And then as soon as people had their first scan, if there was significant growth and they were going to have to come off the trial, they could cross over to the ibocidinib arm if they didn't, if they were on the placebo arm originally. And this ended up being a positive trial where the progression-free survival or the time it takes where the tumor is controlled before it starts to grow, it was longer in the patients who got ibocidinib compared to placebo. And specifically, the, one of the important pieces here is that at six months and 12 months, you saw 32% of patients and 22% of patients alive and doing um, okay compared to on placebo when people didn't get anything. The six month rate and the 12 month rate of being progression free was um, non existent. And so this drug is certainly effective. It's very well tolerated. Um, it's a pill that people take. Um, I've had patients be on this for more than a year and do well on it. So we're encouraged that this is an option for patients. And now I will just very briefly um, talk about these five other alterations. And it'll be a little bit rapid fire. It's just to basically show that if a patient has a tumor with any of these alterations, we have effective therapies. That's the main message I'm trying to get across. So as I mentioned, there are basket trials. So BRAF 600E is a mutation that's seen across all of these different cancers. So this was a trial where they had many different cohorts and one of them was biliary tract cancers. 33 patients were treated with a combination of drugs. One was a BRAF inhibitor and the other was a MEK inhibitor. This combination has been used in colon cancer. And in this trial, again, you can see a lot of water falling here, a lot of patients under that 30% mark. And the overall response rate was 51%. And uh, this combination just got approved in the last couple of months for patients with BRAF B600E positive tumors. This is not specifically for cholangiogenic carcinoma, but the FDA said, based on that trial, anyone with a BRAF B600E positive tumor um, that meets criteria would be eligible for this. So we saw a 50% response rate, oh, more than 50% response rate. Um, and then for patients who have HER2 positive biliary tract cancer, which you see a lot of this in gallbladder cancer and extrapatic cholangiocarcinoma. I know we always spend a lot of time talking about intrapatic cholangiocarcinoma, but we do certainly see targets in extrapatic as well. Um, we learned a lot from breast cancer where HER2 positivity is much more common. This combination was first tested in, in breast cancer, but has also showed activity in patients with biliary tract cancer with 23% of patients having significant tumor shrinkage. And when people were in this category of having significant tumor shrinkage, the median duration of them maintaining that shrinkage was about 11 months. So this is another combination that is now on the NCCN guidelines, which are the national cancer guidelines for how we manage patients. It's not yet FDA approved for um, cholangiogenic carcinoma, but when things are on the NCCN guidelines, we're often able to ask insurance to cover it. So this is a good option for patients. This is a new and promising drug that's on the horizon. Uh, it's called venadatinumab. Venadatinumab, um, and this is showing activity both in patients who have never had a HER2 inhibitor before and also patients who um, have had a HER2 inhibitor before. And so the confirmed response rate was 40% in a small trial of um, patients who have cholangiocarcinoma. And this is actually now in a larger trial because we wanna see if this drug can get approved for patients with HER2 positive biliary tract cancers. And then, if people have an NTRAC fusion in their tumor, which is rare in cholangiocarcinoma, but you can see here, this purple right here is cholangiocarcinoma. Um, it's less than 1% of patients with cholangiocarcinoma, but this is another one of those disease agnostic approvals by the FDA, where it was a basket trial, where it was patients with many different tumor types who have this NTRAC fusion um, were in this trial, and you can see the response rate over uh, it was 75%. I was just trying to see if there was a combination somewhere. It was 75% um, combining patients who had a complete response or like 100% disappearance of their target lesions um, and people who had at least 30% shrinkage. 75% of people um, had that kind of benefit and then an additional 13% of people had stable disease. And so this drug got approved as did 
a sister drug, entrectinib, which also is addressing patients who have NTRAC fusions, and the response rate here was 57%. So again, good options for patients who have NTRAC fusions. And then RET fusions are also very rare in cholangiocarcinoma. You can see right here is the um, cholangiocarcinoma. It's like dark gray. So you see it here, and you see it here and here. Um, the response rate with this drug was 57%. So in the rare case where we see a RET fusion, we see a lot of tumor shrinkage. And excuse me, again, the duration of response, so the amount of time where that shrinkage is maintained was about 12 months with this drug. And then another RET inhibitor, also a very similar response rate, 44%. And the duration of response here was two years, you know? And so we're really excited to be seeing these kinds of responses with all of these different alterations. And so again, really important that we all get profiling of every tumor because we really wanna see if there's actionable alterations where you can be a candidate for any of these drugs, many of, the, many of which are having some really nice responses. Um, there's several other, drug, several other mutations that we see in biliary tract cancer. This is only a limited list. Um, but they're really promising drugs for all of these different alterations. And so more and more as we do, as we get better at profiling tumors and our technology gets better and our drugs get better for targeting these alterations, we're hopefully going to see better and better outcomes for patients. Um, I love this slide. This is a slide of the NCCN guidelines for biliary tract cancers. And before there was a lot of white space on this slide because there weren't a lot of options. And now you can see that it's a much more crowded slide because there are many more options. So this is what I was talking about um, when I was first talking about the different uh, stages of the cancer and people who have metastatic disease. We have chemotherapy and chemotherapy plus immunotherapy in the first line and chemotherapy in the second line. And then we have all of these different um, targetable, targeted therapies that we can offer patients as well. And sometimes we even give them right up front in certain circumstances. And so for a long time, this is what we had for biliary tract cancers. We had chemotherapy since 2009 and it's second line chemotherapy that also helps patients. That was here in 2019. But since then, we have multiple other approvals which are now allowing patients to have better outcomes. And so tumor molecular profiling has now become the standard of care. I often, when a patient walks into my office and say, hi, I'm Dr. Boyle please let's sequence your tumor. It's like one of the first parts of the conversation that I have with patients because it's just so important. And we also really encourage people to ask their doctors about clinical trials and always think about clinical trials because um, there's so many promising drugs that are yet to be FDA approved. So I have two more slides before I finish with my final slide. And it's about a technology that we're using more and more of to profile tumors. And that is liquid biopsy. I know there's been a lot of buzz about liquid biopsy in the last couple of years. Um, this is a paper that just came out by Jacob Burchuk, who is uh, now faculty at Dana-Farber. And uh, Jake and I have been working together since he was a fellow. And we've been working on this data set from a company called Gardent, which does these liquid biopsies. And overall, what we found in this study of about 1,700 patients was that 44% of patients with biliary tract cancers have some kind of targetable mutation on liquid biopsy. I hope this hasn't happened to any of you, but what we know sometimes in cholangiocarcinoma is that people can undergo a biopsy. And because cholangiocarcinoma tends to be a tumor where there's a lot of fibrosis and a lot of dead cells, sometimes the profiling on the tissue fails and we're not actually able to tell a patient these are the mutations that you have. And so this is a simple blood test where you can get it done at your doctor's office. They now have mobile phlebotomy where some of these companies will actually send an Uber out to your house and you know, deliver the kit to you and you can just get it drawn um, anytime. And this uh, allows us to pick up DNA that's shed in the blood from the tumors that are sitting in the liver or the lungs or someplace else. And it's a really neat technology and um, we're increasingly being able to identify alterations. And you know, liquid biopsies are really good for identifying certain mutations and not as good for identifying other mutations. So for example, IDH1 mutations, we found that the concordance between 
blood and tissue is over 80%. It's very high. Um, it also matters when you get the test done in some cases. In this uh, study that we did, we found that when people got the liquid biopsy done test, the liquid biopsy test done before they had any treatment, there was a much higher chance of being able to capture an IDH1 mutation. And sometimes we actually captured an IDH1 mutation on blood that we did not see on tissue. If you get it done at the time when the tumor is growing, there's also a really high chance that you're going to have DNA shed into the blood and capture a mutation. If you happen to get the liquid biopsy done when you're in the middle of chemotherapy, when you're on treatment, the idea is that the treatment is hopefully controlling the cancer and you're not shedding as much DNA into the blood, then you might be more likely to miss the um, IDH1 mutation or you know, some other alteration. So for IDH1, you know, I can't say this is true for all mutations, but what we've learned is the best time to get the liquid biopsy is either when you have not had any chemotherapy at all or at the time where the chemotherapy or treatment stops working, because that's when you're most likely to have this, the DNA shed in the blood. What we found was for the FGFR2 fusions, the liquid biopsy was not as good. Um, different liquid biopsy platforms are different in this study, which you know, was using the garden assay from a couple of years ago. So it definitely improved over the last couple of years. But at that time, the agreement between the liquid biopsy and tumor tissue was 18%. What does that mean? Does that mean you shouldn't get a liquid biopsy? No, it just means that if the liquid biopsy does not show an FGFR2 fusion, you shouldn't stop there. That maybe if you had a tissue biopsy and checked for the FGFR2 fusion, you may see it there. And we found that it mattered what kind of fusion the tumor showed. If it was a BIC1 fusion, which is the most common FGFR2 fusion, you see that this is really um, captured better by the assay. But if it's one of the non-BIC1 fusions and there are like more than 50 partners for FGFR, then the assay only picked up the fusion in 2% of cases. But then, you know, I was talking a little bit about cd batman which is like the covalently binding inhibitor that we'll hear about from the FDA by tomorrow. Um, in that study, they also did liquid biopsies on majority of patients, and this was using a different assay called the Illumina assay, and in this case, in 87% of the patients that had the FGFR2 fusion captured on blood or tissue as part of the trial, the Illumina assay picked up 87% of those FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements, and in this assay, it didn't actually matter if you got it at baseline or if you got the Illumina assay checked while you were already on treatment. Um, and so, you know, as technology improves, we'll hopefully be able to capture a lot of these alterations better over time. So in closing, I will just say biomarkers, biomarkers, biomarkers. It's really important for us to understand the tumors that um, we see because it's, uh, that's how we think about what is the next step in therapy. And sometimes if you get the biomarkers tested right up front, it could even impact what you go on as first-line therapy because there's some clinical trials of different targeted therapies that we can also offer in the first line. So as soon as possible, it's good to get the biomarker testing done. Um, be prepared because this is how we think about as the next bullet point is going on clinical trials. 40 to 50% of patients with intrahepatic carcinoma have some sort of actual target, target for which we have a drug, 50 to 20% of extrahepatic carcinoma. So be proactive, talk to your doctor, Never worry about offending someone about getting a second opinion. You know, really, you know, I know Melinda always um, advocates for this too. It's just important to have information, you know. And, you know, I was just talking to a young woman yesterday, and her mother has an MSI high positive tumor. And her local oncologist was terrific and offered immunotherapy. But when the immunotherapy stopped working, it was kind of like, what do we do next? And so I really encouraged her to go see. You know, Dr. Borad at, um, at University of Arizona, I'm sorry, not the University of Arizona, at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, um, because that's near her home, to see what other immunotherapy trial options there are and to see what other treatments we have for MSI high cholangiocarcinoma. carcinoma, because only when you get that information can you really get these additional treatments. So I really encourage you to go to nearby cancer centers to seek out additional options. And then the Clanger Carcinoma Foundation website, I and mean, it's terrific. You know, um, there are so many trials that are on that because I know it's going to be a little bit dizzying to go on clinicaltrials.gov and call all of those yourself. 
So Melinda and so many volunteers at the Planned Your Cross Midwest Foundation really have done a fantastic job of doing that work for you. So there are a lot of trials on the website and the contact for who to contact for those trials, which can be really helpful. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that one of the most amazing things about the FDA approvals of these different targeted therapies is that the more we sequence tumors, the more we're going to learn and the more drugs that are going to get approved. So it's like a rising tide where we just, you know, found out this one thing, but now so many patients, hopefully, because it's a standard of care now, we're going to find more targets and companies come when they know that there's a, tar um, a drug to, I mean, a mutation to target, you know? So overall, I feel that we're just, just the tip of the iceberg seeing these couple of different uh, FDA approvals. I think it's going to lead to even more FDA approvals over time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today, and I look forward to your questions. Um, but first, I will maybe hand it over to Volker so we can talk about some of the and then we'll take questions. Dr. Gull, thanks so much. And uh, also from my end, uh, really a pleasure talking to you today. And what I would like to do is uh, in the next couple of minutes, just briefly talk a little bit about um, a mechanism that is in place in particular for trucks that have been already in development for quite some time and have shown activity. And there's a phase in the drug development where we also already know that the drug seemed to have activity, but it's not yet available on the market. And if we can go to the next slide, I think Lipika oh, sure. still might have been in control of, of, of the slides. Thanks so much for that. Um, I would like to speak a little bit about it, this expanded access program and uh, illustrating that with an example of one of the drugs that Dr. Gyal has mentioned, futibatinib. And um, as we can see on the, on the next slide, these expanded access studies or expanded access programs, if we can advance the slide, Lipika. Thank you. Um, has an own mechanism that um, if uh, has already been the drug investigated in controlled trials and has shown activity, but is not yet approved, that the FDA has put a mechanism in place that besides proving for individual patients, if there is an interest from a larger group of patients to and physicians to treat with already that uh, compound, then there can be these early access program studies. That's its own regulation and mechanism by the FDA, but the aim at the end is really to make the drug available for patients in that indication where the drug has already shown activity and efficacy and is in the process of getting regulatory approval and then being available. So with the example of futibatinib on the next slide, there is such a, a study already being established. And um, you can think about that really as a clinical trial, but um, it is with certain conditions that overall makes it a little bit less stringent relative to the drugs or the trials that you need to develop a drug. So the eligibility criteria, and I speak to that in a second or the next slide, um, are a little bit more liberal just to make sure that there is the ability for patients to come on the trial. And if being then on the study, they are treated as if they would be um, enrolled in a typical clinical trial. And there is a list of uh, typical eligibility criteria that we have for this FGFR inhibitor futibatinib that includes for sure the proof and documentation that this gene arrangement of fusion has been um, tested and uh, is, is seen in the tumor, as well as standard criteria in terms of the body function as well as performance status. And uh, if being enrolled then on the trial, on the next slide, then there is a list of um, yeah, a list of different um, assessment that uh, need to take place. But there is, again, um, a little bit more flexibility in terms of how often these assessments being done, taking into account that the information about the drug has been only largely collected in terms of approval conditions, uh, so that there is um, more 
ability to adjust patient needs and also standard of care consideration that being there at the study center where that um, study is open. The treatment in those extended access program then will continue until the patient comes to a point when there is no clinical benefit anymore, so that progression is either seen from a clinical perspective or on the CT scans or any toxicity that wouldn't allow. And like in any other study as well, any time when either the physician or the patient might not want to continue treatment anymore. And on the very last slide, if we advance one more time, um, this is showing you a map of the US where currently for this FJFR inhibitor, the futabatinib, there are study sites out there where access to futabatinib is uh, being provided via this early access study program. It is open right now and patients uh, can still enroll on, those, uh, on this program. And uh, it will be open up to the point when then the compound would be approved by the FDA and becomes commercially available. So that allows here to bridge the time when a drug um, has shown activity but is not yet available for patients. And that's basically is just what I wanted to share with you as I think it is an also interesting mechanism to provide access to new drugs for patients with cholangiocarcinoma. Thank you. Thank you, um, Volker, very much. That is very important and very necessary uh, for our patients. We appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Goyle, we have a lot of questions. I'm <laughs> hoping you looked them over a little bit while you were, <laughs> while we were waiting. Um, I'm just going to start and go go through. Um, there might yeah, I can. I, I looked at a couple of them. I can summarize some of them if that's helpful, Melinda. Yes. Uh, so the first one was, what type of test is used to access RNA and protein markers? I think that was back when you were talking about the biomarker testing in the beginning. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So there, for protein markers, it's usually something called immunohistochemistry. And it's basically they use an antibody to stain tumors. And for specific protein markers, it's usually drug specific. So a lot of companies will say, does the tumor have this marker? We have a special assay to see if it tests positive. HER2 is it one that we look at the protein markers and we can do that usually locally in our own pathology labs. For RNA, you're doing RNA sequencing. It's um, in the expression analysis. Again, that's usually um, done by various companies. Um, and there are also some commercial companies that do whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and do a certain amount of um, protein marker assessment also. And so there's a variety of ways to do it. Okay. So this person wants to know, is the biomarker testing automatically done with the tissue from biopsy in the beginning? Um, the types of protein biomarkers that are it's automatically done in some institutions is to look for uh, the markers that are associated with microsatellite instability. So it's the mismatch repair proteins. It's automatically done in colon cancer. It's not usually automatically done in cholangiocarcinoma. That's certainly worth asking for. HER2 expression also usually done automatically in breast cancer, but not automatically in cholangiocarcinoma. So it's certainly worth having your oncologist reach out to pathology to do those. And the other ones are specific for trials. Okay. So it's not still as routine as we would like to see it, but we want patients to make sure they're asking that it's being done. Exactly. And now there's some companies, if they're um, oncologists that send the uh, tumor out to different companies and sometimes within, you know, institutions with their own platforms, there's more and more that I was mentioning RNA sequencing and some protein biomarkers being done, but it's not routine yet. Okay. Are targeted therapies administered by themselves or is it typically given in combination with the systemic chemo? I would say right now, the vast majority of target therapies are given on their own, but there are combination studies of some target therapies being given with chemotherapy, just the way there's an immunotherapy combinations with chemotherapy. There are some target therapies, but the vast majority are being given um, on their own or in combination with target therapies are usually combined with other targeted therapies or combined with immunotherapy more so than with chemotherapy. Okay. 
Um, the relay trial um, that you talked about, is it only for FGFR naive patients or FGFR inhibitor naive patients? Yeah, so the data that I presented was the most recent data from ESMO where that was an FGFR inhibitor naive population, but absolutely not. It's also for patients who had prior FGFR inhibitors. Um, it's specifically designed to overcome many of the resistance mutations that we see after other FGFR inhibitors. And um, we presented some data last year actually showing that many patients have good disease stabilization and some even have tumor shrinkage with the drug. So the drug is quite versatile and can work in multiple settings. Okay. All right. This is, I love our patients. Do we have the advancement yet or enough data to date to know if the FGFR inhibitors can combat certain specific kinase domain resistant mutations from first generations or vice versa? Do we know if certain specific resistant mutations will not be effective in second and third generation FGFR inhibitors? Very smart question. It's the exact question that all the companies that are developing FGFR inhibitors are thinking about. And so we know that the current generation FGFR inhibitors do a good job in being able to uh, kill tumors and shrink tumors, but we want to do better. And we know these resistance mutations emerge. So there are a variety of different companies right now that have next generation inhibitors in development. And Relay is one of the companies that's put their data in the public domain and you know presented it as not ASCO. But there are a lot of companies that have put their posters in the public domain, so you can be aware of their trials. But yes, there um, a lot of the companies put out these you know traffic light uh, type pictures that I like to call them, where they basically show a variety of different mutations and then show how well their drug does in preclinical models, like in cell lines, for example, in being able to combat these different mutations, and it's compared to the drugs that are currently approved. But at the end of the day, what happens in um, the lab and what happens in patients can sometimes be different. So I think all of that work is really important because it helps us give a sense of um, what we think will happen in patients, but ultimately the proof will be in the pudding and what we see in patients will um, dictate how we develop drugs. Okay. So do multiple tumors typically have the same mutations? Um, and then how about recurrence? Will it change? That's a good question. That's getting at the idea of tumor heterogeneity. And so there are certain alterations that are thought to be driver alterations that are in all the cancer cells. So generally speaking, FGFR2 fusions, IDH1 mutations, and often, you know, BRAF, B600E mutations are thought to be present across cells. There are certain biomarkers that might be more heterogeneous. So for example, HER2 amplification or expression has been shown in a variety of tumor types to vary across different tumors within the same patient. So I think this gets to the good question of if we do one biopsy, should we do another biopsy either at the same time or later on? And you know, again, majority of the driver alterations are in majority of tumors. Um, one benefit of liquid biopsy at some level is that it captures DNA that's shed from multiple different tumors, but there's certainly a role for getting a repeat biopsy if patients develop resistance to certain types of therapies where it's known that we understand some of the resistance mechanisms and it can help us decide what to go on next. So I've certainly had multiple patients who have gotten repeat biopsies and that's helped us figure out what to do next. Okay. It's not necessary uh, in all cases, but it's definitely worth discussing with your oncologist. Okay. Are any of the therapies helpful for a CHECK2 variant? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are DNA damage repair pathway alterations, and there are a variety of different drugs right now that are being developed for patients with DNA damage repair pathway alterations, and there are you know, many of them. Um, in terms of drugs, there are uh, ATR inhibitors, there are PARP inhibitors, there are other um, uh, DDR pathway uh, drugs. So it's certainly worth looking at the specific CHECK2 variant and you know reviewing it with your oncologist and seeing if um, there's a drug that's available. Okay. Is the standard recommendation after progression on Pemazir or Infogratinib to go on remaining FDA-approved med medications that has not yet been tried? Or is there a rationale to try expanded access fudibatinib instead? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, Volker, do you want to take that at all? Or would you like me to take it? 
I think you can speak to the ability that we have to offer via this program, but uh, I think from a medical perspective, you as the expert might uh, better suit to answer that question. Yeah, and Volker, my understanding is the expanded access program allows patients who have had a prior FGFR inhibitor. Yeah, that is so correct. the good yeah. news mm -hmm. is it certainly does allow patients to get onto Fudibatinib. You know, we've certainly seen cases where people went on Pemigatinib or Infragratinib. They had disease progression. They developed some of these mutations, and then they went on Fudibatinib. Some patients got four or five months. Some patients got more than a year from Fudibatinib. We certainly know from the lab that fudibatinib can overcome many of the mutations that we see at progression on infragratinib and pemigatinib. So it's certainly something that um, I think if someone had progression on one of those two drugs and developed these mutations, you know, certainly fudibatinib would be something to consider. There are also other drugs like the Relay drug and a couple of other companies that are developing next generation inhibitors. I think any of these would be very reasonable to consider. Okay. I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but N dash cadherin is a new mar marker for ICC question mark. I think you talked about that in the very beginning. Um, uh, I think you talked about a, a new marker for diagnosing, maybe. Oh, gotcha. So um, that's the albumin ish assay. And so okay. the albumin ish assay, you know, tumors that are of hepatocyte origin um, stain positive for albumin. And so that's something that we're now using to um, diagnose cholangiocarcinoma. Okay. It came in at that time. So that's what I'm assuming, but I don't know. You might, you might I might be totally off. I might send that one to you later for follow-up. Sure. Okay. Um, is there um, any relevance in, okay. So being on targeted drugs, uh, becoming resistant, going back on chemo, is there any, um, benefit in going back on a targeted drug later than after doing chemo. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So we know sometimes when people get a treatment holiday from the targeted therapies and whatever risk resistant clones emerged, um, have a chance to regress and maybe chemotherapy addresses some of those resistant clones. There's certainly a way that tumors can become resensitized to the targeted therapies. So it's, uh, you know, I always encourage clinical trials at that point, but if there isn't a clinical trial of a new drug that's hitting the target, certainly going back on an older targeted therapy or um, a different targeted therapy in the same class is a very reasonable approach that's worth discussing with your oncologist. Okay. Um, can you describe the difference between mutation and amplification? And yeah, so the term mutation is often a umbrella term that we use um, for to encompass fusions, mutations, and amplifications. The other term we sometimes use is alteration or variant as the umbrella term. Um, a mutation is often like one change in the DNA, one change in a base pair, for example, where you get an amino acid go from like one amino acid to another amino acid. Amplification is often when you have multiple copies of a certain um, gene in that area. And so there are different ways to basically activate cancer cells, whether you have a change in the amino acid or you have increased copies of the gene, either of those can lead to, uh, remember I was showing you that signaling goes a bit array and awry and people can have growth of their cancer. Either of those are pathways to have the signaling go awry and targeting both of those um, can be helpful. But sometimes you can have a mutation that uh, does not actually cause the cancer to grow. Sometimes you can have an amplification that does not actually cause the cancer to grow. So not all amplifications are worth targeting, not all mutations are worth targeting. And that's why it's so important to talk to your oncologist about when you see the profiling report which ones of these do we have to pay attention to and which one of these do we have to ignore? And the truth is like, you know, there are thousands of mutations. I personally do not know what all of those mean. And so I will very often consult Dr. Google, you know, and I will check. There are certain websites that we all use where we can put in a mutation and say, okay, is this what we call a pathogenic mutation, a mutation that's likely to drive the cancer and therefore worth targeting or not. And we often also consult our molecular tumor boards because sometimes, you know, mutations are confusing and obviously you're making decisions to treat a patient and have big implications for their life. 
So if I'm not sure about a mutation, I will often send an email to one of our pathologists or consult our tumor board, um, molecular pathology tumor board, to say, hey, what do you think I should do with this interesting, different type of mutation? Wonderful. Um, do you typically see the liquid biopsy being covered by insurance for your patients? I do. I, I think I've never had a patient, except for international patients, but I don't think I've ever had a patient where they have to pay out of pocket. Sometimes there's a copay of up to like 100 or $150. The vast majority of patients do not pay anything in my experience. And some patients pay 30 to 60 bucks. But the good news is most of these companies have a um, financial team where you can reach out to the financial team and they can work with you to get a sense of um, if it's going to be covered by insurance. Okay. And you specific, or you mentioned a couple specific companies that do liquid biopsy, but we're seeing that more and more with a, a lot of companies, testing companies out there are doing it, correct? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't favor one company over another. I think there are multiple great companies. And I was just sharing the companies that we now have published studies from or presented studies at, um, at conferences, but there are many different companies that are doing liquid biopsies, but um, have good coverage of the mutations that we see in clinical carcinoma. Okay. Um, is CT DNA able to detect the FGFR IDH1 resistant mutations? This is also a good question. You know, majority of the liquid biopsy assays do cover the variety of different IDH1 mutations and do cover the kinase domain. That is where the mutations arise for FGFR2. But it's certainly worth understanding the assay to see if the entire kinase domain is covered. But nowadays, I think majority of them recognize that this is what we see for resistance to FGFR inhibitors. So they're all covering the, the vast majority of them are covering the full kinase domain. Okay. Um, are there any FGFR inhibitors that seem to be more effective than others for FGFR fusions versus non-fusions? You know, there's data from a variety of different drugs, you know, infragratin and femigratin are obviously the ones that are approved and we showed the response rates are in the 20 to 30% plus range. Um, and fudibatinib, um, the response rate is also very similar around 42%. So all three of those drugs are um, effective drugs. And now we're seeing the next generation of drugs. You know, the relay drug looks really promising. There are a couple of other drugs that are out there that are also looking very promising. So I would say there are you know, multiple good drugs. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up because we are over time, but I'm gonna do one last question. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Are all NIB biomarker treatments in pill form? Are the side effects similar for all the treatments attacking FGFR2? I'm not sure what that is. Can you say that one, question one more time? Are all N as in Nancy, I, B as in boy, biomarker treatments in pill form? I'm not sure what that is, NIB. I wonder if it's like evocidinib. Like an oh, the nibs. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Biomarker treatments in pill form. And then are there side effects similar for all the treatments attacking FGFR2? I think you went over those side effects. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's infragratinib and pemigatinib. Maybe that's where it's coming from. Um, yeah. So there are a lot of them right now, majority of the FGFR and all the FGFR inhibitors are approved in clandestine carcinoma. You know, the vast majority that I know of that are in development in clandestine carcinoma are in cell form. And um, the side effects are similar across the different drugs. I would say now that we're developing FGFR2 specific drugs or FGFR2 and 3 specific drugs, We'll see if the side effect profile is similar or if it um, is different, but you know a lot of what we're seeing on the relay drug is what we're seeing with the other FGFR inhibitors. All right. Thank you, Volker, and thank you, Lipica, so very much. You guys always do such a great job. We had great questions, and um, we might not have got to all of them, but I will look them over, and if I can pass them on and get answers, I will do so and send them out to the people who asked the question. Um, thank you so much for your time. You guys we appreciate it so very much, and so does our audience. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.